life. Talk Recovery Radio. Live from the heart of the downtown east side, it's Talk Recovery Radio with Giuseppe Gansi and Darren Gaylor on Vancouver's co-op radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. From the streets to the studio, bringing you addiction recovery stories from real people with lived experience and real experts on today's issues. Tune in live every Thursday, noon to one. Powered by New West Recovery. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. And good afternoon, Vancouver. Hello, this is Giuseppe Gensch and Mr. Darren Gaylor. Hello, Darren. Hey, how's it going? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Welcome to the show, everybody. Welcome to the show. Nice to see you, Darren. And uh, if you're watching us uh, on Facebook, welcome. If you're listening to us on uh, Vancouver Co-op Radio, awesome as well. And if you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe to our channel and uh, you can catch us on all the uh, various ways of listening to your favorite podcast. I don't know if we're a podcast, a radio show. We're just kind of everything, eh, Darren? Yeah, we're, we're a little bit of a little bit of it all, you know? Yeah, yeah a little bit of it all. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But one thing we are is, uh, you know, uh, a voice, uh, one voice of many for recovery. And, you know, it's been an interesting uh, week, uh, some some uplifting comments and some some uh, uplifting news and, and also some sad news as well. Uh, province of BC announces $132 million over three years for treatment and recovery services uh, for addiction, which is, and mental health. Uh, so that's amazing news, eh? Like everyone's clapping and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I belong to an associate, what well, I used to, I, uh, removed myself from uh, the association yesterday, um, because I, I no longer really believe that a recovery association that aligns with anything that has to do with Dr. Patricia Daly is, is, is a healthy place. And, and uh, you know, part of the announcement yesterday, and for those of you that follow our show and so forth, you know, Dr. Patricia Daly is, is uh, Vancouver Coastal Health's chief medical doctor and so forth. And, you know, for those of you that listened before, we, we did a Stop Daily campaign. You know, Patricia Daly is on record for saying a lot of uh, harmful things to people that are in abstinence-based recovery. Things like, you know, we're not evidence-based, things like, you know, we should be on medications for the rest of our lives, things like uh, recovery shouldn't even be used as a word when it comes to addiction. You know, I come, I, maybe it's because I'm part of a gay movement. I don't know. That just really triggered me yesterday when I saw her next to Sheila. I sent Sh- Sheila Malcolmson, who are Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, a, a lengthy email saying how inappropriate it was. It's almost like having, you know, somebody that's transphobic going to the Vancouver library to do a talk, you know, the gay community gets en- enraged and they shut the library down, you know? And it's almost like inviting police to Vancouver Pride when they cause harm to, you know, the, the trans community and, and BIPOC people just, you know, hey, just cause she said bad things about you doesn't mean she's not your ally. I mean, it just really triggered me yesterday. and. And, uh, you know, I was told (laughs) by some people that being adversarial is not healthy. And I'm like, yeah, tell that to everybody else, you know, and like she should not be making an announcement that is, you know, for recovery when she doesn't believe in recovery. And so there was an awesome article in McLean's money ain't going to sort out our healthcare issues. You can throw all the money in the world, but when you have someone like the minister of mental health and addictions on stage with someone like Dr. Patricia Daly, who over the years has said harmful things towards the recovery community that chooses to be abstinent, there's a problem. You can throw $500 million to the problem. It ain't going to be solved because there's this big elephant in the room. So what their idea of recovery is, and hey, the absence community is just as guilty in being harmful to the harm reduction community. And no one's trying to fix that. I believe in safe supply. I believe in consumption sites. I believe in methadone. I believe in Suboxone. I believe in 12-step programs that get people clean and sober. And Daily does it. She's on record saying it doesn't uh it's not evidence-based so 
Anyway, I quit. I, I no longer want to be part of the CARA. Uh, I no longer believe in a recovery association that, like yesterday was the time to strike. Like, hey, she can't be on stage just saying the words recovery. And, and it was silent. The recovery community is just silent. And that's her fundamental Achilles heel. It's like the recovery community just doesn't lash out and say, this isn't okay. Um, I don't want Dr. Daly on any advisory committee to talk about recovery when she hasn't apologized, hasn't even, hasn't even acknowledged in the years, hasn't even acknowledged that there's a problem. Yeah. Um, so I just, it's sad. Yeah, yeah. Give it three hundred million. Like it doesn't matter. I, I'm. Uh, you have to remind me what her official position is. She's the. Um, she is the. Um, I'm so stressed about it now. I can't even remember. <laughs> Sorry. Chief Medical Officer for Vancouver yeah. Coastal Health. And and yeah, I'm just I'm just listening to it. You know, typical politician, right? They, you know, they say one thing and then, you know, it's just they're up there clapping and applauding the next thing that completely opposes something that they've said in the past. And, and there's yeah. there's never any any accountability, you no. know, and, no. and, it, and that's you're right. You're right. There, there needs to be a voice behind that. Yeah. And you know what? If I embarrassed myself yesterday, if I'm embarrassing myself right now, I really don't care. It's like this is a real like this is this is what I experienced. Like I've listened to her face to face tell me that I don't exist. And my Darren, like you should need to go back on medication to live a productive lifestyle. Yeah, Do yeah. I, I, Tell that to your two boys. You know what I mean? Like that's how harmful this is. Yeah, and and she no, just you, gets away with it. You you definitely strike in a chord. Um, yeah. I I remember uh, I remember at one of our conventions, and I, you know I was just. You know, starting out my career as a counselor, you know, uh, you know, at our vendor booth, you know, just just one of many options. Again, that the point of like respecting and appreciating all pathways and 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 I'm just there, not anti anything else, but just, you know, talking about about uh, the last door. And, and I remember a, a physician you know, came up and, and, and said, you know, asked me like, what, what's this place about? And, and I told him, you know, it's an abstinent based, you know, you know, healthcare facility, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and he, and he interrupted me and stopped me right there, like abstinent based. And, and it, and it was just this level of arrogance and an outright condescension towards, towards that idea. And, and, and I mean, obviously I took it personal. And I think this is where like certain you know, biases are, are formed within our whole healthcare industry in, in, in each individual and, and looked at me and, he, and scoffed and said, abstinence, like, how can you, how can you treat a, a, an opiate addict? He has to be on, on Suboxone for the rest of his life. And then it's sort of, and it's off. Patricia Daly, the chief medical officer in her little camp that started all that, that is part of all that narrative, not started it, but well, part of it. Yeah. So I want, I want to go on record, like as far as personally and, 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 you know, for the, for our show as well, that I will never oppose the use of Suboxone and the benefit of, of opiate replacement therapies, but I absolutely refuse individuals with that type of arrogance and, and that perspective on, on, on treating an addict, you know? So I, I get your frustration with, with yeah. Patricia Daly. And, and the fact that it's okay, that she sat on stage with the minister, like it's, talking about recovery services so like that's dangerous that's like having a homophobic racist on a BIPOC committee you know like hey we got some money for you here's your hush money now shut the f up and go you know what I mean like that's how bad this is and and uh, I'm not like out of my mind like that's how bad this is and you know I, I remember being 16 you know people telling me why are you so bent out of shape you know, but we don't have like, you know, straight parades. Like it, it just, it really, that's how this issue is. When you have somebody that is harmful to the uh, recovery community making an announcement for recovery, it's a huge problem. And uh, I don't know what my next steps are, um, but uh, you know what? I'm gonna keep raising the voice of recovery how I can and, and uh, we'll go from there. And that's the only thing that we can do, so.
Anyway, this is, that's what this show's about. We just want to keep talking about recovery and, and want to call people out on their behaviors. And lots of people like to call me out on my behaviors. So uh, good, bring it on because it actually helps me learn. Absolutely. You know, I'm a different Giuseppe from when this show started seven years ago and I'm not perfect. And I'm just, you know, a layman guy who, you know, works in recovery and, and you know, does some stuff. And that's it. And, and I try my best, but uh, I, I think we need to call each other out um, so we can all improve. And, and, and hopefully uh, Sheila Malcolmson, uh, our minister is listening. I know she's got her heart in it and I know she's got the, her best interest in helping people. I, I just don't think she's given the right information. So she knows who's standing next to her on a platform. And, and that's what education and awareness is all about. Talk Recovery Radio comes to you every Thursday. Uh, usually live. Uh, sometimes uh, we take a break because we need breaks and uh, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. We were gone for that whole week, but uh, we really appreciate you listening to our show. Seven years of shows, hundreds of guests, thousands of listeners, and uh, we love bringing you the show powered by New West Recovery, which is last door in Westminster Perfect. Houses, Canada's recovery community. Um, and we're on 100.5 Vancouver Co-op Radio. And a shout out, because uh, I always forget sometimes, to our guest coordinator, Jordan Bowman. Thanks for uh, getting us amazing guests every week to be on our show. And uh, we have another great guest uh, today. Who are we talking recovery with, Darren, today? Yeah, we get to talk recovery with Maya Salovitz. Uh, Maya is the author of Undoing Drugs, The Untold Story of Harm Reduction and the Future of Addiction. Uh, 30 years of groundbreaking writing on addiction, drug policy, neuroscience. Uh, Maya has written for numerous publications, High Times, New York Times, Washington Post, The Guardian, Vice, Scientific American, and The Atlantic, and a, an author or co-author of five other books, Maya, thanks for coming on the show today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Um, you're obviously coming here with uh, much experience. Um, and, and the book, Undoing Drugs, The Untold Story of Harm Reduction and the Future of Addiction. I mean, that's, you know, that was the presentation of, of, uh, of our show for today. Uh, but we got you for the whole hour. So, I mean, hopefully we can, we can talk. I mean... A little bit about about our show, Giuseppe and I come from a, a, a you know an abstinent based uh, place in our own recovery, and and you know quite often biases are formed and you know conversations are had. But we were just saying over the seven years of doing our show with any and every guest, you know it, it it's it's changed uh, you know a, a little bit of that that bias or that sort of innocent, you know, defense of, of our own personal, you know, pathways. Um, so we're so glad, you know, you're coming on here um, with, with some more information on harm reduction and, and how that is the future of addiction. Um, so here's, here's what I'm, I'm just going to go on my opinion here for a second. Excuse the rant. I'll get to a point. Um, <laughs> We've, or I've never imposed harm reduction, safe injection, safe supply, uh, it, it, all the whole gamut, right? I've, I've never been opposition, but what I do have a really hard time is the individual that advocates specifically for one, you know, one form of treatment and, and, and sort of has, you know, this idea that this is the fix, you know, and, and, and I'm glad you're shaking your head there. Cause that means you understand what I'm talking about and aren't that specific person that is just, just saying harm reduction. We were just having a, a conversation on the top of the show. I got a little bit emotional because both of us have been told in, in, in our lives, you know, post post recovery that, you know, people, people, all addicts need to be medicated their whole life. Suboxone supporters that, that will, that will say a prescription to Suboxone for the rest of your life or, or that's it. Can we have a conversation around like, you know, what, what okay. your education, what your research on, on harm reduction has been and where it fits in the whole gamut of, of everything. So the research on medication is quite clear 
that if you stay on for a long time, you have a 50% reduction in your death rate from all causes, not just overdose, um, compared to people who don't. So that is just a fact. It's been replicated in many countries across thousands of people and all kinds of stuff like that. That doesn't mean everybody should be on methadone or suboxone. It just means that these are the only two things we have proven to reduce mortality. And this is especially important when we have a supply that is filled with fentanyls and other synthetic things. So if I'm going to advise somebody who is starting out, um, I would tell them this and give them informed consent. And they have the right to make up their own mind about their treatment pathway. Some people will have side effects. Some people will never be able to find a dose that they're comfortable on. Um, some people you know, just can't deal with the hassles of the way, at least in America, and I think to some extent in Canada, we provide these medications. So everybody needs to make their own decision. All I think is that people need to make an informed decision. And given that mortality data, which is really strong, um, if it's somebody I love, I'm going to strongly recommend that they stay on for a while. Um, if, you know, um, again, if that's not what the person wants, you know, the whole thing of harm reduction is meet somebody where they are. And if they're like, I absolutely want abstinence, I want off all substances, this is over for me, then that's what they should have. Yes, I, I'm glad you said that. It's illegal in Canada to actually do that, though. You you can't. Most treatment centers, and well, not most, NBC anyway. You you can't get off your medications while in treatment. You're not allowed to. Um, and so it really turns into a classism thing. It's like if you have the money to go to a private treatment center where the rules are a little bit more lax because they're centered around the program's philosophy, you can taper and detox and so forth. But if you're in the funded system, i.e., welfare, um, then these are the these are you know this is the box, and you can't uh, work your way outside of that box. Some uh, uh, funded programs find ways, but if you notice, find, find ways are interesting. So it's, I'm glad that you said what you said, because it is true, people, it's kind of weird that we get ourselves stuck in a situation, only in addiction, really, where, you know, if you're an airline pilot, you get a certain type of treatment. If you're a train operator, you get a certain kind of treatment. If you're like under the poverty line, this is your treatment. Do you find that happens in America as well, where the treatment models are different for individuals? Well, this is the thing. Um, in the United States, historically, uh, methadone has been provided um, only in very poor neighborhoods. And that is because the rich neighborhoods have strong NIMBY not in my backyard uh, activists yeah. who are like, no, we don't want that here. And it's also because it has the way our federal government um, does the thing, it is like being on chemical probation. So uh, this is not a problem with methadone as a substance. This is a problem with our system. And I'm surprised to hear what you're saying about oh, the, yeah. um, uh, because I understood that Insight, for example, has an on-site detox that is actually abstinent. I, I, I can't comment on that. I'm not too sure. I, I just know in the licensed treatment uh, facilities, like it's hard to find a doctor that's going to take you off your medication. Right. It's just, right. it's like, it, you know, unless you, uh, unless you have money, uh, you know, or like a really strong will. Uh, I mean, we've got countless stories of people like my dog, every time I ask to get off my meds, they up them. That's a very common theme. Oh, they, right, the right. meds must not be working then. If you're not well, comfortable, let's get you more. Can we, my, sorry, my, Darren, can we, can, go, go ahead, Darren. Maya, well, Maya mentioned, I mean, when, when I went to detox, you know, this is 15 years ago and, and then, you know, past that, it was abstinence. It, I mean, it was cold turkey. You know, they help you with some sleeping medication and things like that. But I mean, that salts. Remember those? And then, and then, you know, try to find your way into Epsom salts is what it was. <laughs> oh, Epsom salts. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you find your way into the next step. But but now it's 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 suboxone as the detox. Yeah. It's, right, it's, it's right. completely changed here. You know, let's get into the book, though. Undoing Drugs. Um, we kind of, it was just yesterday they made a huge announcement in BC in regards to money and stuff. So it kind of got Darren and I both revved up in our banter back and forth. But let's get into the book, Undoing Drugs. So who are you and why did you write the book? So our listeners can get an understanding of where you're sure. coming from when you wrote the book. 
Sure. So I am a person who is actually myself in um, recovery. Um, and for at least the first five years of that recovery, it was complete abstinence. Um, I, when I first came out of abstinence treatment, I was extremely opposed to methadone and Suboxone. Suboxone actually didn't exist at the time or it wasn't widely available. Um, so, you know, um, this is an issue that's really close to my heart. It's just that um, I, you know, I have to look at the data and that is, you know, but I don't think anybody, like we don't force people to do things except for in this context, and that's wrong. Um, you know, here we kind of have the reverse problem because two thirds of our, our residential programs disallow, just outright do not allow medication. Um, and so it's, it, it really is a, it's a kind of funny thing that we should have um, these kind of absolutist policies because if anything is true about addiction, one size does not fit all. And this is why, you know, people should be able to have options from like, you know, methadone, heroin, Dilaudid, whatever. Um, it is abstinence, um, antidepressants. You should just be able to find what works for you because there are so many different ways into becoming addicted that um, there need to be multiple ways of, of coming out of it. And I understand why a cost-cutting government would be like, well, this thing reduces a death rate 50%, so it's the only thing we're gonna pay for, but that um, is going to be problematic for some people. And I think if we, um, so I come to this from a personal place, but I also have um, been a journalist for, I guess, 30 years or more. And so I have studied the research kind of across disciplines and, written a lot about it and talked to a lot of people. Um, so that's that's kind of a little bit about my background. And so if somebody reads the book, what they, can, can you help us understand? Well, uh, is this for parents? Is this for drug users? Is this for everybody? And, and what are you hoping to accomplish when somebody finishes reading the book? Sure, so um, basically nobody had ever written a history of harm reduction. And um, to me, it's a really vital idea that also encompasses things like abstinence. The whole idea of harm reduction is that we should first prevent people from getting hurt, then you know, not stop them from getting high. Like we should be um, kind of neutral about whether a person experiences a high. I don't want the government to have any business with my ecstasy. Um, you know, it's like, it's none of their business. Where the government should come in is to stop people from getting hurt. And that's what the idea fundamentally of harm reduction is. It is about focusing on harm, not focusing on use. And so um, I was kind of there um, for some of the origins of harm reduction within the United States. And I visited uh, Liverpool, which was one of the very early um, places to create, Liver the people in Liverpool basically created the harm reduction as a movement. Um, the idea, you know, first do no harm has been around forever. Um, and the Dutch created the first needle exchange. But the Liverpudlians came together and said, wait a minute. Uh -huh. you know, uh, Liverpudlians, people from Liverpool. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry, cut out for your call. <laughs> no, no, it, it is like a weird I like, term, and I don't <laughs> want to start saying Manchunians about people from Manchester, but um, I right. just did. Um, yeah. Anyway, the um, that is what they are actually called. Um, but um, the people from Liverpool, um, a group of them came together and said, you know, our policy right now is agnostic on harm. Our policy is just um, the only thing we care about is stopping this drug or that drug. And we don't care if we kill anybody in the process. And in fact, when people try to um, stop people from um, uh, taking substances, it, we actually prefer, I mean, for example, in the United States, we were literally told, don't give people information about how to use bleach to clean their needles or let alone give people needles because that will send the wrong message to the children and we want you, the drug user, to die to send a message to the children. And it didn't, the outcome of policy was about how many drug arrests there are, the number of people using. It had nothing to do with like who lived and who died, who was healthy, how their lives were. 
um, let alone the fact that our drug laws were created out of a series of racist panics rather than out of actual concern about the best way to deal with the problems associated with certain types of drug use. Well, I mean, just, just the arrogance to think that they're the ones to give, to send the message to our children, like, like as if it's their job, you know what I mean? I, I, I'm sure there's lots of children that aren't getting mentored, you know, in respectful and appropriate ways, you know, but it just seems like, it, it, did they really mean that? Like, yeah, I mean, you know, like I, like, this is how I got into all of this because somebody taught me to use bleach to clean my needles. And that meant that, you know, in New York at the time, half of the IV drug users were already HIV positive. So this basically saved my life. And I was like, you know, this is basic information. Bleach is cheap. Why aren't people telling me this? And then I got all this, like, we're going to send the wrong message. We're going to encourage drug use. I'm like, you know, I, I tried to actually, I was, I was at a methadone program. I was on methadone at the time. And I tried to um, put up posters about how to use bleach. And they wouldn't let me because that would encourage people to use. Now, I knew for a fact, and they knew for a fact, that at least half the people on that line would test positive for drugs um, because they were doing those darn urine tests all the time. Um, so, uh, and observed, and it sucked. Um, so, you know, this was a real thing. And this is like, I mean, this even goes back to prohibition of alcohol in America because during alcohol prohibition, our government actually forced manufacturers of industrial alcohol to poison it so that if people drank it, they would die. And I don't like, and I mean, to me, the thing that's, that's cool about harm reduction is it flips the morality of that over. It says, as a person, what do you care more about? Somebody getting unearned euphoria or somebody dying? Most yeah. people care more about somebody dying and they don't believe that like somebody dying in a corner of HIV or an overdose mm -hmm. is going to serve as an example to anybody because the kid doesn't even know that person exists. Um, you know, and we have tons of data showing that scared straight and things like showing people autopsy photos or, or sending them to jail and have people yell at them actually do the opposite. They encourage use. Um, so Can I stop you right there, though, on, just on that comment? So uh, we, uh, you know, our founder has been around for a long time and stuff. He's no longer, he's retired now. But he got interviewed one time by somebody when they did the crystal meth ads, like this is your, you know, person's journey. And uh, and they asked us, you know, does this work? And, and his response was everything works. Like it might not work for the person that's in the downtown east side on crystal right. meth, but it might work for somebody who wants to go to college and decide, hey. That's, I not, I mean, that's not what the data shows. Right? I, but I know, I know it's not what the data shows, but there's a lot of people that see those ads and say, don't want to do drugs, right? So I'm not saying that the data is wrong. I'm just saying like, <laughs> like it's it who okay, but, knows but when you what have, works, when you right? Have, when you have randomized controlled trials that show okay. exposing people to this leads more of them to use drugs. Okay. Um to me, that's enough data to suggest that this is a bad idea. So can, um, I, can I also just, so, you know, I don't want to get into the data part. It's just an idea out there because you know, there's so much data out there. What I wanted to really ask is, we've done something wrong in North America when it comes to harm reduction, like Liverpool. I've been to Portugal. I'm doing a movie called Crisis. I looked, I, I wrote, you know, we were in Portugal. We filmed everywhere, their whole decriminalization model and how no one talks about the commission of drug dissuasion in Portugal. They just talk about decrim and the founders are like, I don't know why they don't talk about this dissuasion. We tell everybody about the dissuasion commission, but nobody talks about it. Doesn't even make the articles sometimes. It's interesting. It's like when you look at the European, like there's no skid row in Lisbon. Like it's gone. They had one. It, it's gone. And everyone says decrim did that, except Dr. Golau, who says decrim had nothing to do with getting rid of our skid row. There's got it. Like there's a like well, that why is about been... inequality. I mean, you know, Portugal has nothing like the level of in economic inequality that we see um, in Vancouver and in New York. Now, I'm a native New Yorker. Yeah. I was shocked when I went to the down, downtown east side by the fact that you have these luxury condos with beautiful terraces overlooking people shooting up in the street. Mm -hmm. And New York has plenty of people shooting up in the street and, and extreme economic inequality, but it just isn't as condensed as it is there. So, so and I was 
you know, and I mean, so I, I think that, you know, one of the things that the Europeans do right, and you do more right than we do, but still not 100% right, um, is provide social services for people like housing and um, health care. Um, like, we are certainly more extreme than you in terms of uninsured people who can't get any health care, let alone only get medication, um, or, um, you know, people who um, are on the street. And so, yeah, I mean, I think like the, the reason that the problem of addiction is so complicated is that it is kind of a symptom of something being wrong with your society. I mean, the healthier your middle class, the less addiction you have. Um, and the, um, you know, sort of the more you take care of people and the less you just throw them away, the less addiction you have. Now, again, even in the perfect world, you're still going to have some because people have childhood trauma, people have uh, mental illness, um, people have various things that are going to lead to various sources of despair. What do you think? What do you, I, I, I love this conversation. What, I, I really want to know your, your opinion on this comment, something I believe in. What do you think of this comment? And, and something that uh, from being, our radio station is actually in the downtown east side. I miss going down there. It's closed because of COVID, but it's actually, it's on Hastings, our studio. Um, so I wish, I, I wish we were there right now, but um, we're not, we're on Zoom. So my, my comment, one thing that I've kind of come up with, with my experience and my traveling to Europe to do this movie, it's like in Europe, if you have a, and, and the government shouldn't get involved in, in your ecstasy, I love that. I believe that it shouldn't belong in your bedroom shouldn't belong in your, like I believe that but the minute you are like you know walking down the street with sores all over your face remember that day Darren when she was just bleeding from head to toe like bleeding because she was just you know and we like who are you gonna call we didn't call anybody it's just we just just walked into the studio and left her out there because there's this sense of like what are you gonna do it's like she's She's doing that to herself and it's just not one multiply that by hundreds right and it's like in, in Portugal if you do drugs it's your business, but if you're harming the community and you're harming yourself. We will help you with the commission of drug dissuasion where it's okay to do drugs if you want to smoke a joint do a little bit of heroin and, and, and still be a they called it the citizenship, but if you're not productive citizenship and I don't know who's the barometer of whose citizenship level should be where and, and that's not my my payroll but in Canada and I'm sure in the states and I think this is really the underbelly of where we went wrong with harm reduction in this country if you have a problem with somebody pissing on your doorstep shooting heroin smoking crack you need to change not the person that's doing the drugs on your street and so the that's, social disorder here that is it's, well, it, it's here. Like it is in Vancouver. Like it, it, that's how you know. That's how it is in Vancouver. So I can only yeah. talk about where I'm at. No, so no, what, no. But I what mean, do you think of that whole concept? Do you think we? I mean, again, I am like the thing that I know is that treating people poorly does not help them. Um, locking them up does not help them. Yeah. Coerced treatment does not help them. Um, if you have somebody who, you know, I mean, when you look at the data on coerced treatment, it is no better than voluntary. And there's many reasons to suggest that it is worse because if you have a whole bunch of people who are forced into a program, I'm going to be talking about my child abuse and they're going to be sitting there like, oh, when can I go home? And that does not create a very conducive therapeutic environment. So um, I think that when you're talking about people engaging in outright antisocial behavior like peeing on the street and, and this kind of thing, um, provided that there actually are public toilets that they can use, um, then yeah, that's the um, other piece. Yeah. You know, um, then you know, you can talk about um, trying to do something to change that. I mean, I think, you know, nobody supports that. I'm not a fan of like pissing on the street um, or of like, you know, people shooting up on the street. Um, I think that um, it is just um, extreme trauma, extreme poverty, um, extreme mental illness and extreme addiction are serious complex problems that there is no one answer to. Um, you know, the, we here go for the like, let's just coerce them and lock them up. And you can see how much of a failure that is. Um, you know, our, um, you know, when you look at 
our treatment outcomes. They are nothing to write home no, about. No, I agree with you 100%. So Portugal has been doing dissuasion for over 20 years. Yes, and but that is, that is voluntary. Now. That is voluntary. Uh, exactly. If you, if you show up to the dissuasion committee and they tell you to go to treatment and you don't go, you don't go to jail. Yeah. Well, there's and, still a little, but there. Well, one second though, I, you know, and I, I've got it all on tape. Like the first time, the second time, the third time. By the fourth time, you start getting community service hours. Yes, By the fifth again, time, you start getting tickets. By the seventh time, you start getting like strongly encouraged to go to treatment. Right, right. But so, that is so there's that fundamental for 20 years. There's that fundamental piece that hey, if I do drugs and and I'm on the streets, like it's not like I don't have a free ticket. Like I right, can't. Well, just, I mean, but they don't. Again, it's like if you look at the actual number of people that get locked up on arrest number seven, it's yeah. like minimal. Because um, they've been dissuaded, right? So or because or because, you know, for whatever reason, I understood that in Portugal, the vast majority of drug arrests are still for marijuana. Um yep. and those people just go right to dissuasion. I filmed never... people smoking marijuana under they wouldn't even smoke the joint on the street. They were worried. Well, right. Can I you mean, believe so that? <laughs> But I mean, so right. So like, it's the, um, again, like, you have to look at what, if you take this person from the downtown east side that you were just talking about covered in blood and, and all of this, and put her in Portugal, maybe their actual treatment system provides better options. Or maybe it's the case that she is so traumatized and so mentally ill, um, that the only thing you can possibly do is do your best to make her not feel as miserable and unhappy as she is. So, yeah. you know, when you just talk about addiction and drug use from the extremes, you end up with policies that are lousy. Yeah. Um, so- I applied you know, to that. <laughs> yeah. And this yeah. has been the struggle the whole while, especially when you have, you know, a, a downtown east side, then then the money and, and, the, and the political, you know, SHIT gets gets all jammed towards, you know, this idea of harm reduction that really may only have a use for a certain demographic. Yeah. You know, you talked about like there's a problem within society, and every society is different, right? Like, so I'm, I'm not hearing you, you, you know, I hear you sort of, uh, you know, questioning the Portugal model. Is that because no, you, I'm not questioning the Portugal model. Work in New York. No, I'm, that's, I'm not questioning it at all. I'm, oh. I'm just saying that like people believe that dissuasion equals coercion and it doesn't. It doesn't, oh. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so there was um, New York is really like, you know, here- Would it just, work in New York? Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. we would need to have real healthcare provision for people. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. In a situation of like 30, 40% of people uninsured, like, how are you going to get them to treatment unless you're free treatment? For you know, it's just like, this is so like- So many fixes first, right? There's so many. You know, I mean, but I mean, the thing is also though, if we took all the hundreds of millions of dollars that New York alone spends on arresting and incarcerating people around drugs and put it into a variety mm -hmm. of treatment, um, we could do a hell of a lot better than we're doing. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I believe that. I totally believe that. It's just unfortunate that we're arresting. I mean, yeah, arresting people for drug use is... is well, it's dumb. I mean, there's yeah, it's no really possible dumb. justification for arresting people. You know, we don't arrest people for diabetes when they eat a donut. We don't arrest people for cancer if it goes into remission. I had a um, Pepsi for lunch. <laughs> like, you know, it is not like, this is not the way people change their behavior. If we care about people and want to help them change their behavior, we work with them where they are and we help them move along. And the other thing that I think is really important to talk about, um, particularly about the downtown east side, is that the people you see on the street are a tiny fraction of the people who have been engaged with harm reduction. Can I share and a story so, with you? Um, wait, wait, let me. Let me oh, sure, go ahead. Um, the the successes, the people who became abstinent or who are completely stable on maintenance or who are doing well, do not stand out. Um, you no. don't see them. And, they disappear. Well, right. And so like, so the, the thing is that like, if you, in contrast, if you go to say an abstinence rehab, the failures disappear. 
like everybody there is like shiny and happy and looking like, you know, they're doing well because they are in an abstinence treatment place. The people who aren't drop out. So harm reduction always looks worse than abstinence simply because of what is known as the availability bias. And so it's important for us to realize that like both of these things are true, that like some people can do well in abstinence. Some people are gonna do well in maintenance. Some people are gonna do well in just going to the gym or something. Um, and it is it is complicated, but it's important to realize that like- You, you just said it, like that is the problem. You just said it, like it's just, Yes, some people do well here. Like I know guys that come here to detox off Suboxone because they say I'll die if I stay on this bed. And then people leave here. You know, they're on Suboxone when they come here. So I, that's where my head is like, because we do private, like this is a treatment center that puts on this radio show. But the thing that's unique about us is we do private care and we do funded care. So we get the guy coming in from the downtown east side and we, we get the guy that flies airplanes. They get the same treatment model. But then you have a funded program where it's like, this is your program. You know, this is, you're not like, you, you, like you're going to be on meds for life. But here's the thing. You can't be on meds for life and fly a plane on certain doses of meds anyway, right? And so I was talking to somebody one day. Wait, wait, what did you just say? Well, they're because, be of for, life because of, for some medications, like benzos and all that kind of stuff, there's certain qualifications you need to be able to fly a plane or operate a train for safety reasons. So for well, example, so plenty of people on, um, you know, there's, there's very little evidence that people who are maintained on a safe, you know, an appropriate dose for them and are not using on top of methadone and suboxone that they can drive, they can do all these things like anybody else. There's okay. no, you know, so this idea that like um, you are constantly impaired because you're on maintenance is just, again, not supported by the research. Um, the, you know, yes, we have prejudicial laws that say like doctors cannot be on um, buprenorphine or methadone, um, but that doesn't mean that those are based on science. Okay. Um, and people are on, people take benzodiazepines for sleep and are pilots all the time. In okay. fact, many rely on them because of the complexity of their schedules. Okay. So okay. yes, you cannot be actively high on something while you are a pilot, but the, um, the vagaries of tolerance, you know, I mean, what I think about the thing of impairment is, first of all, most of the people on the roads that are severely impaired are sleepy. They are not on anything. They have just been up for 18 hours for whatever reason, and they probably would be safer if they were actually on amphetamine. So the idea, in fact, the army in the United States anyway, and the air force give pilots amphetamine when they have to be on long missions. Um, so this is all just complicated by culture and by all kinds of things that, um, you know, that we have prejudices about. And so, you know, the, the fact that I think it's absolutely fabulous that there is treatment that is good for people across the economic spectrum and is not treating people differently. But an executive who is a, you know, or a pilot has very different needs generally than somebody who is unhoused and uneducated. And the thing about recovery in all its forms from all types of addiction is that you need new sources of meaning, safety, comfort, and purpose. And those are gonna be much easier to get if you're a doctor or a pilot or somebody else who has an education and resources. Mm -hmm. And so of course the recovery rates are gonna look better for, for that group simply because they have more resources. This is true with every disease. Um, so it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard. And, and I think that like, you know, people should certainly have options, but if you take an executive and put him into a treatment center that says everybody must have job training um, and um, everybody must do, you know, X and Y, then you're going to end or up with art therapy or, or, you know, all the other kinds of, it's, yeah, I mean, the, the programs have become so box shaped. We believe in building recovery capital. So building recovery capital in an individual will help them increase their health outcomes 
because it's not like this is the box you need to fit in. It's like, these are your high recovery capital domains. These are your barriers. Let's work on your barriers so you can get back to living a life. And, and, and if you don't want to build your recovery capital, don't. But you know this is one of the, the problems in your life is you're not working. Like, it's like applying for a job. Well, you have to apply for one. <laughs> you, know, you can't just talk about it. So it's like really basic stuff. And, and, and so the idea that... The story that I wanted to share was somebody was telling me how everybody on crystal meth needs to go on a safe supply of crystal meth. And just this, and this is a, a pretty high up person in the field of addiction in BC. And I'm like, well, well, like, that's not true. Like some people like, like need to get also like stop using crystal meth. And it's just like, well, the evidence shows that if they're on safe supply, I'm like, and there was just happened to be a crane up in the air and I'm pointing at it. You see that crane up there? Well, my friend used to do a ton of crystal meth in one of those things. He's clean now. So would you like him to be on a safe supply of crystal meth? Because it's not going to work because he can't tell his employee he's on safe supply. He can't go to a clinic to get his safe supply. He's not going to go on disability and make $1,200 a month when he makes $6,000 a month as a crane operator who's high. So we're creating well, My feeling these... is, but why don't what do you think test... about that? No, why I don't hear. we test people for performance, not substances? In other words, I don't care what you're on. If you can pass the performance test of whatever skill it has to be before you get into the airplane or the crane or whatever, Great. I love this but conversation because it's really pushing buttons. Testing, so <laughs> I hope you're not offended by anything where this is a great chat. Like no, no, really, no. Like I, you, you know, know, I am like, I am a person from New York. We like our perfect. <laughs> I'm from Ontario originally. Okay, so let's talk about a performance test. So yes. say I pass that performance test. The, the I mean, me as an addict there's like, I might do a little bit today. I'm going to do a lot tomorrow. You know but what you I mean? So it every day. I mean, see, if we actually wanted to improve safety in, in these situations, we would do that. The problem is corporations would never go for it because yeah. lots of people would be ruled out on daily, uh, you know, for tiredness or for other things that do genuinely make them unsafe on a given day, but that would mess with their productivity. Yeah. So that's the reason we have substance testing rather than, you know, substance testing is kind of a crude way of getting at some of the most extreme um, cases. Um, but I think that, you know, no, of course, everybody on crystal meth doesn't need safe supply forever. And the thing that we know about the, at least from the trials on safe supply of like heroin and um, yeah, just heroin, um, that people are no less likely to become abstinent if they are given a safe supply compared to if they're just left to their own devices. So it doesn't keep people using longer um, and it just keeps people alive longer. I do think that there is a problem when we're not giving people support who don't wanna be on medication and do wanna be absent. Like people should get support for whatever, you know, you really like harm reduction is like meet people where they are. And if where they are is I want absence, then you have to meet them there. It is not like, okay, to, you know, just have one size fits all in either direction. And, you know, so I think that, um, again, like all of this has to do with um, informed consent and with supporting people in the path that works for them. Yeah. It, I mean, that's, that's the hard part, you know, to sort of distinguish because I, I, I really truly believe like, like some, I've talked to somebody somewhere along the line that would, you know, pay homage to Insight, a safe injection site for their current success way of life. You know, somebody who one person that watched a, a commercial on, on on the harms of of crystal meth. If that per, if that commercial changed that one person's mind. I mean, that's that idea, you know, that everything works. But the thing is, is that like, not everything works for everyone, Everybody, yeah. you know? So when, when, when there's a big push for safe supply, it's like, who, who, what demographic are we talking about here? Because the mom that lost her, you know, 17 year old from, uh, you know, a toxic drug supply, um, it was never going to to stay alive because if there was a, a safe 
a safe supply unless that safe supply is being handed out at school where him and Johnny, you know, we're going to talk to Billy about, you know, my mom's away this weekend. So let's give that a try. You right. Know? And I think that the, um, this is the, this is again, the complexity. Right. In any of the instances, like we know, for example, that there's, um, you know, like, like the scared straight stuff for most people, it does not work, particularly for young people. Um, it's really effective on women my age. Um, mm. You show me something that's terrifying and I will stay away, but I don't have that teenage brain anymore. Right. Um, you show them that and they're like, oh, cool, that looks good. Um, that's exciting. <laughs> you know, so it's like, it is like when there are things that conflict, you have to be careful to like apply the thing that works for the person or the majority of the people in that category effectively that way. So I think also like the, um, you know, and right, nobody's going to say, let's give a 16 year old who wants to start shooting up, like, here's your needle, go for it. Um, so what we want to have, I think, um, the only way to deal with that is the way that we have kids getting alcohol and marijuana and tobacco now, which is they get them illegally from a safer supply. Um, and so, um, you know, it is not going to be possible to eliminate all harm. And this is why harm reduction is a thing. What you have to do is try to minimize it by using the policy levers that you have and by not being ridiculous and saying, oh no, we'll just like let 16 year olds go and buy like uh, needles and um, crystal meth. Um, nobody thinks that's a good idea. Right. Um, so, but you have to account for the fact that with any supply, there will always be leakage to kids. And how do you make sure that whatever that leakage is, is the least harmful? And this is to me why I'm like perfectly happy with commercialized marijuana, because that is way less harmful than the vast majority of the other things that people are gonna get their hands on. Um, and, you know, to, again, like, I feel like if you wanna prevent addiction and you wanna treat it well, what you have to do is start with why people use and minimize the things that predispose them to addiction. So that means that if a kid is, you know, some kind of outlying kid who's like maybe extremely impulsive or extremely anxious or whatever, help them learn to manage that trait before they start taking drugs to do that. Um, and not in a labeling targeted, you're bad because you have this trait, but just like this trait comes with advantages and disadvantages, here's some ways of managing this. So if we can minimize, also if we can minimize child trauma, which is harder, um, uh, you know, but if we can get to those kids who are severely traumatized early before, again, they develop the bad coping skills that lead to addiction, then if they get exposed to drugs, they are much less likely to be harmed by them. And so, um, you know, and much less likely to be addicted. Um, so I think kind of thinking that way and thinking more about like, how do we prevent this complex mess of things that we see happening to certain people who are poor, mentally ill, traumatized, addicted. Because when you get to that level of complexity, it's very, very hard to help. So not to say that we shouldn't, but I'm just saying, ideally we prevent people from getting to that point. Right, so I mean, the book Undoing Drugs, like, you know, the, it says, you know, the untold story of harm reduction, the future of addiction. Every, everything Vancouver has done so far has resulted in an augmentation of overdose deaths. Every month, every year, it's just going up. I don't think, but I mean, I think that actually, wasn't there a point um, that it actually did plateau before fentanyl came on the scene? I, uh, I'm pretty yeah. sure that like, there really is actually a plateau where it was, it was beginning to get better and then fentanyl came. Yeah, I don't even know if it was really considered a crisis, you know, before the the whole, you know, fentanyl. Like it was just like as the downtown east side, like people are over overdoing, you know, they they over right. they overdose because they're using heroin. Like of course, it's part it's part of addiction. It's been a part of heroin use for you know uh, however long that people have been using heroin. <laughs> like one of the things I also want to say, like that is interesting to me as an American, um, is that. The overdose rate that you have, like the number of people dying from overdose that actually gets you guys to care 
is so much lower than the numbers that get us to care. I, you know, I, I, it's I'm, like you have like a couple of thousand overdoses. We have like almost a hundred thousand a year. And like, we still don't care. Like, I mean, we pretend to care, but it's like the, um, you know, when I was looking, I was like, wait, like, why is there this, um, you know, um, intense level of concern? And I'm like, oh, Canada can gets concerned <laughs> at an earlier stage than we do. Um, it's still a problem. And I'm not saying that any deaths are acceptable, but the, um, you know, it just, it really did interest me to see that it became seen as a crisis at a much earlier stage than it did here. And they're labeling it a crisis. I mean, it's a crisis on Twitter. It's a crisis on Facebook. But the reality is, is it's like the AIDS. I, I went through the AIDS crisis and I remember back then and I remember what it was like. It's nothing like what's going on right now. Like I, I have, I mean, I didn't have a cell phone back then, but if I did, um, like the number of people I know that are dead. It far outcries the number of people I know that died of AIDS, far out number. And when those people were dying back then, um, we all kind of got together and rallied together and we all walked in unity down the streets to say, this is wrong, look at us. And for some reason today, we're not walking down the streets together in unity. The abstinence community is just as guilty. We said at the beginning of the show, it's do the steps or die. But somehow now we're like, do harm reduction or die. And there's this brick wall between those two sentiments. And there's an old camp and this camp. And, and it's like fighting words, even today, getting attacked on Twitter, you know, with until we get rid of that wall, like we, will, we won't solve this overdose crisis. Because I remember being a new guy and somebody telling me, you know, a healthcare worker, you know, telling me how to get clean and, and kind of guided me that really doesn't exist anymore. Really, you could lose your job in, 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 in BC if you're at the frontline worker talking about abstinence recovery. And I don't care what anybody says on Twitter or Facebook, like that's a reality. I've had employees share with me, they've been reprimanded for talking to people um, that could use a meeting uh, to never suggest that again. Just give them- I mean, that's email, like, okay? that's completely absurd. You know, it's okay. like, it is so it, much- the But it's, because it's, it's, it's the- it's the frog boiling in water. It's like, that's what's happened. And, and, and it's a reality here. And, 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 and I don't, I love talking to you. I don't, we're not like, it's just, it's another kind of conversation that we're just having to let people know there's a mess out there and we're throwing money at it. <laughs> you know, some people are anyway. And we still can't seem to like walk down the street and say, hey, if you want to get clean, like, we can't even use the word addict anymore. Millions of people call themselves addicts and it's become the radioactive word in BC. We can't even use it. You go to a stakeholder meeting and say, so I have this shirt with gold lettering that says addict on it. And yeah, I feel like a clown I mean, wearing it sometimes. It's fine for you to self-identify that way. Well, apparently it's not. Like, ah, it's not well, I, I mean, that's like, see, again, the, the people just yeah. swooping from experience. It's like organizing games. Yeah. Pride Day, but don't use the word gay because 90% of the world hates that word. And when I said that at a stakeholder meeting, well, that's different. I'm like, no, it ain't. That's not different. Like, people want to kill me because of my sexual identity, but I still use the word. And 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 it's not different. It's it's and so I hope the work that you do, you know, continues to build unity. I love the way you responded to some of our questions. Like, it really makes me happy that somebody who believes so much in harm Production, which we do too, also believes in recovery. And, and I think that's where the disjoint is. And until we get rid of that disjoint, you know, and, 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 and stop the bricks walls being created, people are going to die because they get lost. They get lost. Yeah. Like, you know, we get I mean, you guys. Like what, one of the things that um, uh, I think your colleague said at the beginning about, you know, um, when you are in a particular form of recovery, sort of feeling like this has to be the only way, otherwise I'm going to be tempted. Um, and all of us have those tendencies and it's important to be like, no, like this works for me, that may work for you. And like, if it's abstinence that works for me and non-abstinence that works for you, I have to know for me that it's abstinence and I don't get jealous. <laughs> Well, it, was, it, it was the same experience from you. Like, had you not been shown the bleach, you know, it, and, and, and related to that 
being a part of, of saving your life or keeping you from, you know, getting who knows what you, you, you know, there, there, you wouldn't maybe have even thought to advocate for, for that, you know, for the, for the, the purpose of that. And, and it's same with me. I think back and I'm like, well, I wonder if, if I was, you know, sort of told that I have to take this low dose of Suboxone when I get into, into detox and, and then I met with the doctor that, that a physician that says, you know, you're going to need to need to take this for two, two years. Like, where would I be today? So of, of course, we're all allowed our, our protection and, and our passion for where we come from and what helped us. And that's what I'm saying. There's everywhere along the line, I've met someone that has that passion for something that if you only say this is the way it's going it, it it's going to you know stop overdose and save lives this is the oh, that's when we start to fight right yeah. and it's like this 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 need to have somebody meet you where you're at and 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 have options and choices you know that well, that, I mean, can, that is what's that is what harm reduction is supposed to be about it is never supposed right. to be that you only get to take medication like that is like yeah. nowhere in any of the founders of harm reduction's heart was that well <laughs> i mean i, I we kind of we kind of noticed you know that like the the harm reduction that's being you know on you know put out through media or you know even just just known as the the safe injection site there is way more of a history and there was probably a founder that had you know a real sense of of compassion for you know a, a, a using addict at the time than than it's become and then you know segregated in you know in between uh, all these other pathways as the as the fight to what what works and and what doesn't uh i i, I think has to stop and, and i so i i'm in your book, it has that history. It has that beginning uh, of, of harm really reduction. Talk, yeah. I think I think that will bring a whole new perspective yeah. because when we don't know, I got a feeling that. this book's about real harm reduction and what harm reduction was supposed to do. You know, I just want to dedicate this show uh, because it's kind of like brought back so many memories of conversations I had with lots of people. And, and this show goes out to Jordan, you know, Jordan V, she was pregnant. She was a downtown East side drug user. Uh, she, her methadone and Suboxone doctors uh, told her that she had to be on medication for the rest of her life to be a mom and even be able to see her kids and all that kind of stuff. When she gave birth, she believed that she was still using fentanyl while on Suboxone. She did what she did to get her fentanyl. And uh, you know what, a private interventionist got involved because of the family because she was pregnant and uh, now she's clean uh, multiple years clean and she got her kid in her life. I think he's like five years old. And, and so we need to figure out how to fix that situation. So it doesn't happen to the mom who doesn't have a family that's got money for private treatment. And uh, I think if we can figure out and, and figure out how to make Jordan's story not happen to another mom, I think we've got solutions. And, and I think this book, will help people understand what harm reduction is really all about. Um, undoing drugs, the untold story of harm reduction in the future of addiction. Um, thanks, Maya. Thanks so much. And yeah, visit, hope, visit yeah. Maya's website, M-A-I-A-S-Z, or Z for you uh, Americans, dot com. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, hopefully we can have you on again soon, maybe talk yeah. about another book. Yeah, another uh, book, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I hope you had fun with us. Yes, definitely. And um, yeah, you know, like, I mean, I think being disagreeing about various things without being disagreeable is the way to make these things move forward. So um, thank you very much. Awesome. So one Take day care. We walk down the street together. Yeah, right? yeah one day we all walk down the street together. Keep in touch. We'll see you later. Take care. Thanks for listening, everybody. Talk Recovery Radio brought to you by New West Recovery. Thousands of guests, no, thousands of listeners, hundreds of guests, seven years of shows. Replay us on all the iTunes, uh, YouTube, uh, whatever your favorite streaming device, or go to our website, talkrecoveryradio.com, and you can find links to uh, uh, Undoing Drugs, the book. Thank you. Take care, everybody. See you next Thursday. Bye bye.